Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore. Presidential elections in Ukraine are set to be held on Sunday, and it looks as if chocolate magnate or chocolate tycoon Petro Poroshenko, who supported the Maidan protests, is set to win. But how will his presidency fundamentally differ from that of the former ousted president Yanukovych? Now joining us to discuss this is Volodymyr Ishenko. Volodymyr is a sociologist studying social protests in Ukraine. He is a deputy director of the Center for Society Research in Kiev, an editor of Commons, Journal for Social Criticism, and a lecturer in the National University of Kiev, Mohila Academy. Thank you for joining us, Volodymyr. Yeah, good evening. So, Volodymyr, let's start off with, uh, who is Poroshenko? Uh, Poroshenko is one of the, the, one of the hundred richest people in Ukraine. He's uh, well known for his confectionery uh, production for his chocolate. Uh, he, he's called the uh, chocolate king in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, it's uh, quite true that he's uh, the likeliest winner of the coming elections. Probably even he's able to win in the first round of elections. So basically on Sunday. And it's been reported in the press that he had supported the Maidan protests. Do you think that his presidency is going to fundamentally differ from that of uh, ousted president, uh, former ousted president Yanukovych? Uh, no, for various reasons. It's uh, uh, it's quite clear that he uh, will not give up his business, and uh, I don't expect that he will not uh, use the state preferences and his new power. Uh, to help his uh, business interests as well. So it's uh, it's actually the y Yanukovych uh, b b created his uh, financial industrial group with the help of uh, uh, state uh, apparatus. But uh, Poroshenko is a rich man. He is a business, and this is actually the first time in Ukrainian history when the oligarch. Uh, directly become uh, becomes a president. So does does his coming to power then represent a sort of a new seizure of power by a different uh, different set within uh, the oligarchic class? Yes, uh, although it's it's it, it, it can be just slightly different in the nearest future because Poroshenko is uh, is now dependent on uh, the genuine support from other oligarchs. The problem with Yanukovych and one of the reasons why, why he was uh, why he went down, when, why, why he lose, uh, lost uh, his power, that he was trying to uh, take uh, too much control over economy and the state for its uh, for his own uh, oligarchy group. It was called uh, so-called family, uh, basically family of Yanukovych and his relatives. And at, and at this moment, Poroshenko would be much more dependent on support of uh, other oligarchs because uh, the situation in the eastern Ukraine is not going to be pacified with these elections. And uh, Poroshenko would be also more dependent on the Western government, on the Western powers, uh, because of the IMF financial help, without which uh, the Kiev government would not be able to solve economic. Uh, situation in Ukraine. And also, not very evident, not very clear, but still uh, kind of like behind uh, military support from NATO is also very important for, for, for Kiev government, because the Russian uh, foreign invasion is, is quite a real possibility still. So uh, since the ouster of, of uh, Yanukovych, it's been widely reported in Russian media and uh, some left media that there's been a seizure of power by neo-fascists and the far right within the political establishment. Um, how, how fair do you think this characterization uh, is of the current uh, political ruling class with, within Ukraine? And how much does the far right and uh, parties like, let's say, Svoboda have within Ukrainian civil society? Uh, yeah, you have to be quite uh, precise here. And uh, this exaggerations about the role of the far right are so so over present, and they have to be uh, uh, counteracted. Of course, uh, the, there are far rights in the new government. So both have uh, uh, four ministerial positions, 
the, uh, actually not four, it's, uh, it's three now. They had four in, uh, after Yanukovych uh, escaped Kiev in, in March, but the Minister of Defense is not from Soboda at the moment. Um, and there are also other people with high uh, governmental positions, which uh, if they are not um, uh, the far-right activists anymore, but they still uh, had far-right background in, in the past. For example, the Minister of Education, the, uh, the Secretary for, nation, for, national, for National Defense and Security, uh the, 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 these people had uh, had been the activists of the far right organizations but uh, they are not anymore uh still uh this is, the presence of support is dangerous but uh, you should understand that b while uh the eastern ukrainian uprising is still going on they would not be able to promote their nationalist policies so this uh, uprising in Donbass is working as a kind of like balance. If if they would try to promote some something really divisive and uh, nationalist po policies, uh, they would only put more fuel to this fire in the east. And uh, on the other hand, you 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 cannot just ignore because ma ma many people, for example, say that uh, you, you look at their like uh, electoral ratings of. Uh, so border leader Oleg Ternibok or the right sector leader Metro Yaros uh, they have very little something like one two three percent according to different polls so they don't have any chances to compete in the coming elections but uh, still uh, they have more support uh, as a party so their party ratings uh, actually uh, is growing, especially for Svoboda. The uh, support for Svoboda went up from 5% in, in March to 7% in, in May. And uh, so the, the, the increases, uh, they're increasing their chances to have more, have more support during the next uh, parliamentary elections. And uh, they, they would be also be able to uh play on some oppositional issues uh, for example if they if they would be smart they could use their deteriorating social economic situation in ukraine and uh, go against the imf austerity policies if they if they would go to the opposition they may have uh, chances to uh, increase their support even more do we see uh, a coinciding rising of support for leftist parties no, uh, the problem is uh, that, uh, uh, in fact, we have, uh, for the for the for the recent years we had only uh, one party which could at least pretend to be leftist. That was uh, the Communist Party of Ukraine, but uh, the, in fact they were the leftist supporters for Yanukovych regime. One of the most embarrassing things that they anonymously voted for the repressive laws uh, of uh, January 16, which uh, quite significantly restricted the civic liberties, freedom of speech and freedom for peaceful assemblies. Not even, the, not even everyone from the ruling party of regions voted for those laws, but every MP from the Communist Party of Ukraine. And they, they, they were actually very much discredited. They, for my, by, by many people, they were not even seen as a leftist party at all. Uh, for example, the, 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 the richest woman in the parliament, uh, Oksana Kaletnik, uh, she was uh, an MP from the uh, Communist, party of, uh, Communist Party faction. So they were directly dependent on... Uh, uh, some oligarchs in Ukraine, and they were actually defending their interests. And at the moment, the Communist Party uh, is uh, can be actually uh, banned for support of separatist actions in the Eastern Europe. The the acting president uh, of Ukraine, uh, Torchino, is has called for uh, some trial against the Communist Party and uh, the possible resolution of this uh, trial can be uh, the ban for the party. 
And on the, on the other hand, uh, there are some new left initiatives and quite important one, but still they have uh, quite marginal positions and uh, they are very weak and very divided. And this Maidan uh, protest has only uh, added to this division and uh, it's... Uh, M many people on the left cannot even speak with, uh, with each other and cooperate now because some supported Maidan and some uh, some groups support the anti-Maidan protests uh, at the moment in the eastern Ukraine. Let's let's shift the conversation to the the political rebellion that's taking place in the eastern regions of Ukraine, like Donetsk. Uh, there's been several different accounts that I've read uh, that characterizes the protesters. Some of these accounts in describing them as uh, self-organized independent militias that have no particular um, affiliation or you no know, particular uh, sympathy for Kiev or Moscow. Um, other accounts describe them, especially in the Western press, in New York Times you'll see them described as pro-Russian militants who uh, seek annexation from Russia. And then some other accounts I've also read have described them as uh, have described the the political rebellion in the East as a, a workers' rebellion, nonetheless with orders issued from the the coal and the steel uh, oligarchs. Which of these uh, which of these characterizations do you think is fair or accurate? Uh, the leaders of the protest are definitely the pro-Russian separatists, and uh, these are the people. Many uh, many of them are actually uh, Russian citizens. Uh, like, for example, Igor Strelkov, who, who is uh, the Ru Russian citizen, and he's uh, suspected to be a uh, uh, in Russian intelligence uh, officer, uh, so like, like real Russian agent, but uh, there are also many accounts that he can be just, uh, uh, just a simple volunteer, volunteering for this uh, a cause to separate Donbass from uh, from Ukraine, and uh, other leaders of Donetsk uh, People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic, they do really have Russian nationalist uh, views. Even even the constitution of Donetsk People Re People's Republic is quite uh, actually conservative. It's it is even more conservative than the uh, Ukrainian constitution. For example, they basically they banned abortion. They proclaimed uh, the state religion, uh, which is to be a Ukrainian Eastern Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, but uh, having to say this, it's, it's uh, you, you cannot reject that the, the, the separatist rebellion in Donbass has uh, some mass base, and uh, for, for example, according to the last polls. Uh, uh, taken in, uh, conducted in uh, the beginning of May, 56% uh, of uh, the citizens in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions, uh, they see the uprising as a people's rebellion, and not as a, not as a terrorist act, not, not as a covert aggression from Russia, but as a legitimate people's rebellion. Uh, so the majority in these regions uh, do see this uprising as legitimate, and uh, uprising with legitimate claims. And, so, and uh, on, the, on the other hand, yes, uh, th there are some workers' support, but also that's, uh, there are some workers who are on the side of uh, Kiev government, and there are many actions actually of, by workers who do not support neither Kiev government nor uh, Russian separatists. And how also would you characterize the some of the, I mean, you mentioned some of it before, but how would you characterize some of the, the politics of, of these rebellions? Are they mostly mostly of a nationalist character? Uh, it, it's uh, you, you cannot actually uh, talk about the politics at the moment because they didn't have so much time actually to uh, to do some policies, and uh, one, one of their for example, it was uh, an exaggeration from some of the leftist authors who compared this uh, People's Republic with Paris Commune, and but it, it is not it is not like this. They uh, for for a whole month they were they were uh, they were not actually taking power in in these uh, regions. They started to take actual power only after. Um, after referendum on May 11, so only in the in the middle of May, not 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 so 
quite, quite recently. And uh, the, the uh, ideological texts, like the constitution, as I said, it's, it's quite conservative. It's, and it, it is not uh, so much le uh, leftist or social uh, or whatever you can call it. They, uh, they, uh, they try to, uh, actually, there is a lot of talks about the nationalization, but uh, this nationalization is... Uh, connected to the more to the position of uh, the richest man in Ukraine, Renat Akhmetov, uh, who is based in the eastern Ukraine. He's from uh, he's of eastern Ukrainian or origin, and he, he has many property in the eastern Ukraine, in, in Donbass particularly. And recently he uh, said that he's, uh, he will not pay taxes to this self-proclaimed People's Republic, and uh, that He's actually, he was trying actually to, mobiz mo to mobilize his employees against uh, Donetsk People's, Re uh, People's Republic without actually, without much success, I would say. And in, re and re in return, the leaders of separatists said that they are going to nationalize uh, Akhmetov's industries. But uh, it would be too exaggerated to see it as a kind of like leftist turn or leftist policies they, they are now in the objective situation where they uh, are threatened by the Kiev government they, they do not have so overwhelming support uh, within uh, Donetsk region they, they are fighting with the oligarchs uh, who are based there and who are actually sponsoring the so-called volunteer battalions to fight the separatists and in this situation, they have some uh, maybe objectively moved forward to nationalization issues and uh, other issues. It's, it, it will be also important how the social economic situation will develop in Ukraine. For example, if, if it's uh, continue to deteriorate and uh, when people will see the um, uh, how, how much they are going to pay for electricity, for public utilities, uh, according to... IMF required the austerity measures. This social component in the surprising may become uh, more significant, may become more uh, uh, evident and clear. And these people will uh, will talk more about uh, the social demands, about social economic demands. But uh, actually, I doubt that uh, these Russian nationalist leaders would be able to to lead the social economic struggle. And I, 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 I don't think that they would become like uh, leftists or socialists uh, in this way. So the, uh, it would be the, mo the most precise way to characterize this complexity. It would be to say that uh, the, uh, there are real, uh, really important and legitimate grievances which are driving uh, Donbass people against the Kiev government, not only identity issues, not, not only cultural issues, but also social economic. But this, uh, this whole idea with uh, separate uh, people, people's republic, they, they basically they're channeling this, uh, this uh, social economic grievances and social economic protests to this nationalist agenda, to pro-Russian agenda. And it, it is not beneficial for development of uh, genuine uh, social protest for social reform in Ukraine. So what do you think needs to be done to bring an end to the civil war in the eastern regions of Ukraine? And do you think the presidential election is going to play any role in that? Uh, no, that's, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that this election will not uh, pacify the eastern Ukrainian regions. Uh, many people are now um, waiting for kind of like legitimate president, but uh, Poroshenko is not would not will not be seen as a legitimate president in uh, Donbas. Uh, now he has only something like six percent support in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, oblasts, and uh, so six percent is just is, is nothing. And moreover, in in many, in, probably even in, in the majority of electoral districts in Donbass and Lugansk uh, regions, no elections would be possible to have. They are controlled by separatists. 
so w w what would be the reason for Donbass people to see uh, uh, Poroshenko as a legitimate national leader if they were not even able to vote for him and uh, they do not trust him and uh, they don't support him? And uh, basically now we have two options for Ukraine. Either we, either we will have a large bloodshed and escalation of civil war after presidential elections, because the Ky Kyiv government uh, is not going to stop uh, so-called anti-terrorist uh, uh, operation. And uh, as far as the armed rebels do have uh, support among local civilians, and they can, for example, hide in the uh, resident uh, blocks in the cities, in the actually in the, in the houses where, the, where, where the people, civilians live. Uh, this uh, military action would lead uh, to more and more victims, deaths, and uh, suffering to the local population. And they they they, they would only. Um, uh, push them into more opposition against the uh, Kyiv government. And in, in the final instance, it would be uh, not the worst scenario if it will only be just local Ukrainian civil war without participation of Russian forces, without participation of NATO forces. Uh, there, there can be much more uh, devastating uh, for the whole world scenarios. And uh, alternative option, uh, the peaceful option, is uh, uh, to have negotiations with uh, uh, the leaders of the armed rebels. Uh, at the moment, uh, in the last weeks, uh, Kyiv government was trying to organize uh, roundtables of uh, so-called national unity, but they were speaking with the party of regions, uh, representatives, the former ruling party uh, under Yanukovych, which had uh, its major support in, in the eastern Ukraine. But at the moment, they are, do not control anything. They are not the legitimate authority for the eastern Ukraine. They are not uh, real representatives for the uh, people who took up uh, the arms against Kyiv government. So this is more like a show. It is more like... Uh, mm, this is not a serious negotiation. For, for, for peaceful solution, you, you have to start the, the negotiations with those people who are actually fighting with each other. And uh, okay. uh, it, it would be possible, it, it, the, 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 the best option would be uh, if uh, we will see some moderate uh, wins, uh, both in Kyiv government and among uh, pro-Russian separatists that uh, would try to negotiate with each other and that, that they would try to uh, marginalize the radicals on um, both sides. But the problem is that we, at the moment we do not see uh, the emergence of these moderate wings. Kyiv government se seems to be very much unified in, his, in its position against uh, the separatists and they are anonymously saying that uh, no negotiations with the terrorists. And, uh, but the problem is that, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the terrorists stop, to be, stop uh, being terrorists uh, at the moment when they become uh, the uh, freedom fighters, at the moment when they become the legitimate uh, power at, at some territory. And uh, on the other side, we, we, we are seeing now uh, growing contradictions with, within the separatist camp where, for example, uh, the mayor of uh, Slavyansk uh, town, where the whole uprising started, is not supporting the Donetsk People's Republic uh, government in Donetsk. And so, so we see more, uh, more a kind of, not, not a unified camp, but more or less uh, contradictory and uh, even um, quarreling with each other, various groups of separatists. And in principle, Kyiv government can play on this and can try to differentiate that we can negotiate with these people and we can support these people against other uh, 
but uh, at the moment they are doing quite stupid uh, continuation of military action that it's only leading to more suffering for Donbass people. Uh, Volodymyr Yashchenko, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.